Hello, I'm Reverend Scott Whipperman, pastor here at First Presbyterian Church in Helena, Montana, and we welcome you to our worship service today. I'd like you to know that regardless of who you are or where you are in your journey of faith, you're welcome here at First Presbyterian Church. Our New Testament reading from Gospel reading is from Mark, from Mark 7. And Jesus has been teaching around the Sea of Galilee and performing miracles and doing healings. And this is where our scripture picks up. Jesus left that place, the Sea of Galilee, and went to the vicinity of Tyre. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on a bed, and the demon was gone. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of Decapolis. There some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephetheth, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. And Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. The people were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The word of the Lord. Well, in the 1930s, it was a dark time in Germany. The Nazi party was rising to power, and along with it, Hitler. And they were making it clear that the Jews in the country were unwanted. It was a series of proclamations and steps that made it clearer and clearer that they were not wanted in this country. They were not part of the Aryan race, the pure, the strong Aryan race. And we know where this ultimately led. But in Germany at the time, there was also hospitals that cared for the crippled and for those with mental infirmities. And these hospitals were wonders for caring for these people, frequently children that were in these places. But as the Nazi message spread about the strength of the Aryan people, these cripples, these with mental infirmities, became unwanted as well. And they were euthanized. They were taken and they were killed. And as Germany spread, as it conquered other countries like Austria, they took over the hospitals there. Dr. Osberger in Austria was doing the research that first identified autism. And he had such a school, such a hospital there that was bringing many of these people into full life and community. And the Nazis also took these children and euthanized them. They were unwanted. They didn't fit the image that was trying to be portrayed. And the sad thing is that many of these cripples and children were the trial run 
for how to kill larger number of people, how to kill larger numbers of Jews. And in our scripture reading today, if we go back into the old times, the poor and the sick were also unwanted. They were often cast out, set aside, thrown out of society, not invited to be part of things. And the Proverbs, as I said, is a collection of pearls of wisdom. It warns about this. Of the, of the pearls that we had today, the five pearls, three of them directly deal with how we deal with the poor, how we deal with these quote-unquote unwanted. And the other two deal with the poor indirectly, talking with, about how we should deal with them. Saying things that we should not drag the poor into court just because we know we got better lawyers and we're bound to win. And 900 years later, James is writing to the church and he's saying the same thing. He's saying, don't discriminate. Don't discriminate against those that have little and discriminate for those who are wealthy. Because he warns that that is not the right way to do things. He says that we should welcome all. He says, don't treat the poor as the unwanted. And in the time of Christ, the Jews quite often referred to the Gentiles and the Sumerians and other people around them as dogs. The word they use could be dogs, it could be translated as scavengers, as kind of bottom feeders. They looked down on these people. These were the unwanted. They weren't clean and holy like they were. And today, the unwanted still exist, right? We still quite often look at the poor as the unwanted. How many communities have passed laws against being homeless? trying to drive out those that they don't want. And in Europe and in America, we're having lots of migrants come into our country. And there's much talk in Europe and America against these migrants, saying that they're unwanted. Yes, the unwanted is still alive today. In our contemporary time, there have been economic pundits, people who have stated that it's the poor who are holding down the economy. That if it wasn't for the poor, our economy would be doing a lot better because obviously the poor don't have money to buy stuff, right? And if they had money to buy stuff with, the economy would be running better. We'd be making more and selling more. And so the solution is to get rid of the poor. And unfortunately, some of these pundits' solution is not to get rid of the poor by educating them and bringing them into society. It is by liquidating the poor, figuratively getting rid of the poor and helping the economy. I'd say that counts as extreme unwantedness. So these are words that we're hearing. But it's not only the poor. I know that when I went to high school, maybe when you were all in high school, um, the geeks and those who were, uh, shall we say, fashionably challenged were often unwanted and were cast out and set apart. And quite often in business nowadays, the business has a bunch of unwanted, so they do a layoff, get rid of the unwanted. We just heard China had this big military parade and the premier of China announced after this that he was going to reduce the size of their army because the army needed to move into the modern times. They needed more people for naval and aircraft type of operations. And he was going to cut the army by 300,000 soldiers. You can imagine these are probably the foot soldiers that are going to be cut. 
These are the unwanted, the ones that aren't needed anymore, that are cast aside. And then we have warnings about how we should treat the unwanted or not treat the unwanted. Proverbs warns us that if we treat the poor poorly, that calamity will come upon us. It warns us that if we drag them into court, we might just find God sitting on their side. That might be who we're up against in our defense. We were expecting no one, an easy victory, but here we are up against the creator of the universe. Dwayne Preby, uh, president of a Lutheran seminary, quoted by Gordon Lithrop, a Lutheran writer that publishes many books, a scholar, quotes him as saying that whenever we draw a line in the sand that separates us from the others, Jesus is always on the other side of that line. And James warns us that if we show this favoritism, if we treat the unwanted as unwanted, that we sin and we're convicted by the law. There's warnings about these. So there's a call to prudence. There's a call to compassion. There's a call to treat the unwanted, the poor, properly with justice. And Mother Teresa often said this quote, that let us touch the dying, the poor, the lonely, and the unwanted according to the graces we have received. And let us not be ashamed or slow to do the humble work. Let us touch the unwanted. These are all great ideas and wonderful pearls of wisdom. And then Jesus Christ comes along and says, Fooey. Fooey to all this. In our story, Jesus Christ was in the, by the Sea of Galilee. And he was doing work there, teaching and healing. And he decided to go to Tyre. Now, Tyre is on the very northern border of Israel, on the coast. And this border, as borders did in that time, shifted back and forth. And sometimes Tyre was inside Israel, and sometimes it was outside Israel. And during King David's time, it wasn't part of Israel, but Tyre was friendly with Israel. But they also rejoiced when Israel was overthrown because that would make them a bigger trading port. That would bring more business to Tyre. So sometimes there was a bit of animosity between Tyre and Israel. And Jesus goes there. And at this time, this is not a place that Jews would like to hang out. These were the unclean. But Jesus chose to go there. And the story tells us he tried to do so somewhat secretly, but a woman finds him out. And she comes to him. Now this woman, who is she? She's a Greek. She's a Gentile, for heaven's sakes. She is born in Phoenicia, a place not of Jewish origin, not in, within the Jewish kingdom. She is an outsider. She is a Gentile. She is, by definition, unwanted. Heaven forbid she's a woman, and she's coming and daring to speak to a man in public, which was against the rules of the time. Women were not even supposed to talk to their husbands in public, much less someone they didn't know. And here is this woman, this unwanted, coming and doing this. And this strange conversation breaks out between the two. She asks that her daughter be healed of the demon that possesses her. And we get into this weird talk of taking food from children and giving it to dogs. And of that even the dogs must eat the crumbs that the children leave behind. 
the interesting thing is the word Jesus used for dogs. It's not the word that the Jews used when talking down about others, about the Gentiles. They used a word that could be translated as dog or a scavenger. But the word that Jesus used, the Greek word can be translated as dog, but also as pet. And this woman saw and sensed an opening in what Jesus was saying. And she kept with the image that Jesus was talking about. She didn't shift it. She said, yes, that even the dogs eat the crumbs the children leave behind, using the same word that Jesus used. And Jesus says, for this reply, your daughter is healed. He heals her without touching her, without doing anything. And the woman goes home and finds her daughter healed. And then Jesus goes further north to sit in, further into the land of the unwanted, and teaches and does some things there. And then he takes a southeast turn and goes on the east side of the Sea of Galilee over to Decapolis, well east of the Sea of Galilee, also kind of a sketchy area from a Jewish perspective, dealing amongst the unwanted over there. And they bring him an unwanted of an unwanted, a man that is deaf and can barely speak. And Jesus draws him aside and heals him. And he commands, doesn't suggest, he doesn't say it'd be nice. He commands them not to tell anybody about this. And of course, are they quiet? No, they go out and tell everybody. <sighs> How can they stay quiet? Here is this man, he comes, he does these miracles, he performs these healings. And the healings are much more than the physical manifestations that he does. The repairing of a broken tongue and ears that don't work, the removal of a demon, the healings go much deeper. And they erase the you and the N from the front of that word. They say you're wanted, you belong, you're accepted. See, Jesus doesn't tell us to treat the unwanted nicely. Jesus does away with the unwanted. Not in the liquidating sense, but in the class. He says there is no such thing as a class of unwanted people. He does this by going and showing that he deals with the unwanted, quote-unquote, just like he deals with those who are in positions. Jesus is declaring, you are wanted. So if you ever think you've been in the class of the unwanted, know that in Jesus' eyes, you're not. You're always wanted. You're always desired. Christ wants to be in relationship with you, wants your presence. There is no unwanted. That is a fiction. That is a lie. So know that Jesus wants. Jesus wants you. Yes. Good posters to have around. <laughs> Don't need Uncle Sam saying that. <laughs> Jesus wants you. Everybody is wanted. Jesus doesn't know the word unwanted. Amen.